Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Balance of Power. I'm Joe Matthew, live in Washington, where it's all about CPI Day today. Everyone up early, including Molly Smith to put pen to paper, or I guess type away on the numbers here. And we're going to dive into this with Molly in a second with the headline, not what the administration wants to see. Remember the hotter than expected jobs report on Friday? Well, now U.S. core inflation is topping forecasts again. And this has, of course, implications for the Federal Reserve, not to mention the outcome of this uh, presidential election. Top line and core inflation up four-tenths from January. Molly Smith Set the alarm extra early today as Bloomberg Economics editor to crank this out at 830. That's got to be a little bit of heartburn, right? I mean, when, when the big ones hit like this, the jobs day, the CPI day, everybody's watching. It certainly wakes you up at that hour for sure, Joe. Um, and I got to say, like just hearing Charlie run through the market trading right now, I'm just baffled at like why stocks are up as much as they are. I sir, I would love to hear yeah. what good news investors saw in this because I really didn't see it from my seat. Okay, so let's get into it because, you know, on Friday we were talking about the push-pull of the jobs report and, you know, you can find a good story to tell if you look at it the right way. In this case, shelter's up, gasoline is up, car's up, clothing, airfares. Have you tried to book a flight lately? This is what people are talking about at home. Yeah, exactly. So like you just said, this was um, just a lot of, um, you know, pretty robust reading across the board. Um, I mean, I guess if you really wanted to slice and dice it, the positive here, so to speak, was that there was a bit of a pullback in this really narrow category of services inflation that the Fed looks at Mm -hmm. very closely, if you've heard people describe core services X housing. So this is what this one pulled back a bit from like a very strong January reading, but really went more from like rising very sharply to still rising pretty quickly. So I wouldn't say it was exactly a slam dunk in terms of people looking for positive news to take away. Um, Maybe Mm -hmm. that shelter inflation also did come down a bit, but shelter combined with gasoline contributed to over 60% of the rise in the overall CPI in the month. So these are things that people pay for every day. So if you're um, the average American consumer right now, it certainly doesn't make you feel good to know that your housing costs and gasoline are still very much rising. Yeah, right. Is there hope, at least in the volatility behind energy prices? I mean, obviously, gasoline uh, has seasonal factors here. Maybe you see some relief in the next couple of months, or is that wishful thinking? It's certainly possible. I mean, this was the first rise in the whole energy category that we saw in five months. So, um, you know, Mm. lately that had been a driver more of disinflation on the overall headline. But as you said, these things are seasonal. Um, You know, patterns can change. And also, when you see airfares so high, more people might want to drive, and then that could drive up the you know demand huh. for gasoline, and therefore the price of that as well. <laughs> no, and the cycle continues. What what can you tell us about airfares? The biggest monthly advance? Did I read that right? Yes, the biggest monthly advance since May of 22. Uh, so that one really came up quite a bit in the month. And it's interesting because we saw a report earlier today from Southwest saying that they're going to have to reduce capacity yep. given all of the struggles that they're having with uh, fewer Boeing deliveries, as you know, uh, we yeah. certainly know about that story and how that's been playing out. Um, but I think that's something you Thank could – I think Ryanair may have also warned of something similar to uh, capacity uh-huh. constraints. So. That's, of course, also just going to push up prices more so. So I'm not sure if that was a factor in the February reading, but certainly could be in the months ahead. Have you flown since the door blowout, Molly? Uh, I flew in last month. I did fly, so maybe I'm contributing to you the did. problem. Um, did but you I think booked about the flights it, well in advance, um, and they were it was like a $200 round-trip oh, okay. fare to Atlanta. So I think that's pretty good. Pretty good. Might be twice that by now. Did you try to sit, you know, see people getting on the plane, they're trying to figure out where the door plug is, even if there isn't one on the plane. Oh, my goodness. And then they buckle up before being told. That's a fascinating element of this for me. I don't know about you. Yeah, I mean, look, I would do it, too, if I was nervous that a part of the plane was going to blow out when I was, you know, 30,000 feet in the air. So any precaution necessary. (laughs) 
All right, so um, we've got PPI tomorrow. Uh, does this take on new meaning? Because I have to ask you about the Fed here, of course. Uh, Molly Smith, everybody says that, that this means we're, we're not going to see anything till June at the earliest. Uh, yeah, it looks like that's where most of the bets are circling around. So we're getting PPI on Thursday, I believe. And that one's going to be like the last major inflation report that we get before the Fed's meeting next week. Obviously, I don't think really anyone right now is expecting a rate cut at that meeting. So that's very much penciled in mm -hmm. to be a fifth straight hold on interest rates. So the PPI is important. This is um, prices paid to U.S. producers. So it's a measure of wholesale inflation. And this is really more important when you're talking to economic forecasters because there are categories within the PPI that filter into what's known as the PCE, and that's the Fed's preferred inflation measure. There were some of those mm -hmm. parts in the inflation report today as well. So a lot of economists say once the PPI numbers come out, that's when they start to firm up their estimates for PCE, which by the way, is running much lower than the CPI does in part because it doesn't weight shelter as heavily. So that one is trending a lot closer to the Fed's 2% target. And that's really more the one that drives policy in their opinion. Fascinating. She's the smartest person in the room, which is why we try to talk around times like this when the data are so important. Molly Smith, it's great to see you, Molly. Thank you. Uh, we'll connect on the next major data point, I am sure. Bloomberg Economics Editor, we bring you to the source. I hope you get to sleep at some point. Uh, Molly, you know, it's primary day. Because every time we talk about this economic stuff, we have to do it against the backdrop of politics. And if you're Joe Biden, this is topic number one, right? Unless, of course, I'm told that the poll says the border is more important than the economy. But we're coming pretty close here. Certainly as we head around the rest of the country with primary elections. And today we've got some big ones, none bigger or more influential or potentially more revealing than the one in Georgia as I read in the AJC, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Georgia primary uh, could set a presidential rematch, but there is more to it than that. As we try to read tea leaves here, results could give both of these men, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, insight into the depths of their voter support. And that's where we start our conversation with Andre Gillespie. Back with us to talk about Georgia politics, and by that, I guess I mean national politics, because it's pretty hard to separate the two. Associate Professor of Political Science at Emory University. Andre, it's great to see you. What will we learn tonight from Georgia that we can apply to the rest of the nation? Well, today is, is a day for both the Democratic and the Republican parties to practice their get out the vote efforts and their mobilization strategies. We know already who's going to win uh, these primaries. And yeah. we know that at some point tonight, whether it's in Georgia or Mississippi, Donald Trump is going to uh, cross the delegate threshold to be able to secure the Republican nomination. That's likely to happen for President Biden sometime next week, perhaps Florida or Ohio. Mm -hmm. But since we know that uh, they have either no competition anymore or nominal competition at best on the Democratic side. I think what we're going to be paying attention to is who bothers to show up. It's important in Georgia to keep mm. in mind that people have been voting for weeks already in early voting. Um, but if we see robust turnout on both sides, I think that that is a harbinger of how competitive the race is going to be in Georgia. And this election yeah. is really going to come down to which uh, campaign gets their people out to vote. This isn't about persuasion. It is about mobilization. You mentioned the early vote. I wonder to what extent that might influence the outcome uh, with folks voting when Nikki Haley was still in the race. Could that bring some noise to these numbers, not to Donald Trump's benefit? Um, well, so Georgia has a hybrid system where delegates are allocated. The winner gets a certain number of delegates, and then delegates are also allocated uh, via congressional district. Um, you know, it is mm -hmm. possible that Haley could win a district. But as we saw on Super Tuesday last week, even in places where you would expect Republicans to be more moderate, uh, Donald Trump actually did really well in those types of counties. So I think it really does become a question of whether or not uh, Nikki Haley could still win some delegates in, say, the 5th Congressional District, um, you know, or maybe one of the more Democratic-leaning districts. Um, who's to say? Either way, um, between Georgia or Mississippi, and it's probably more likely to be Mississippi, Donald Trump is going to have enough delegates to be the presumptive Republican nominee. Well, that's interesting. You mentioned turnout, and I wonder what the level of interest is uh, in Georgia. When you go to ground, what are people talking about? How are the ads playing, et cetera? 
Um, so, you know, it's still pretty early. The Biden campaign in particular has just done um, an ad buy. Um, and so we're going to see what the fruits of that look like in the coming weeks. Uh, I think it's just really important and symbolic to note that both Donald Trump and Joe Biden were in Georgia um, on Saturday. And so I look at that as an unofficial kickoff of the 2024 general election cycle. The fact that they were here having competing rallies before a primary election, yeah. but during a week where it became very, very clear that these were uh, likely going to be the presumptive nominees, I think is symbolically really important. Um, Georgia is a state that Democrats cannot lose if they want to uh, continue to hold the White House. And it is a state that Republicans wouldn't want to lose because it's a psychological blow. So it's going to be important until mm -hmm. the polls show that one of these candidates has a definitive and consistent lead. We're spending time with Andre Gillespie of Emory University here on Balance of Power. Andre, you were with us back in December of 22 when we came to Atlanta uh, for the special Senate election. Of course, Raphael Warnock beat Herschel Walker, and there was a conversation in the air as we spoke to officials like Secretary Raffensperger, even the way your governor was talking at the time of a conservative Republican not in the MAGA camp. And there was a question about exactly what a Georgia Republican might look like. This is a different world, it seems like we're in now, isn't it? Well, I mean, it is a slightly different circumstance. So Brian Kemp and Brad Raffensperger are not MAGA Republicans, but they're Republicans and yeah. loyal ones at that. Um, you know, it is mm -hmm. highly unlikely that they're going to endorse uh, Joe Biden or vote for Joe Biden or even abstain uh, from voting in the presidential election because of the tension that they have had with the Trump campaign. So they, right. you know, may not be walking arm in arm and campaigning in lockstep with Donald Trump, uh, but it's highly unusual to expect for them to, you know, not ultimately be supportive of former President Trump sure. as the Republican nominee. Sure. And I, I do hear you. But my God, if you went back to that day when we spoke about the Senate race, could you have imagined projecting a year out that Donald Trump would be the commanding favorite in the Republican primary in Georgia? It's not surprising. Uh, primary elections tend to turn out your most politically active and your most ideologically extreme voters. And so there is a tendency in primary elections for the extremes to actually really be the cast the deciding vote in terms of who the nominee mm -hmm. is going to be. And so in this case, Donald Trump still enjoys high levels of support um, among the base. And so the base is turning out um, in strong numbers to uh, ratify their choice for a candidate. It doesn't negate uh, Brian Kemp's operation in the state his history with voters in the state um, or his incumbency advantage in 2022. And so you can do both at the same time. And so Republicans can still support somebody who they've known for years, who has a strong operation in the state, while at the same time supporting this new wave uh, of a Republican candidate like Donald Trump and his allies. Well, so, Andre, could Joe Biden win Georgia again today? Would he be able to pull this off again? And, and what will you be looking for tonight to help answer that question? Um, so, I mean, it is a bit of an apples to kind of pears or oranges comparison. Um, but, you know, if there is very lackluster turnout in the Democratic primary, that probably isn't a good mm -hmm. warning sign. And so the mm -hmm. Biden campaign would have to make sure that they are redoubling their efforts to set up field offices across the state um, and sending people out to do the hard work of talking to voters on their doorsteps and on their uh, phones to make sure that they actually do turn out to vote in an election. Um, there's still a numerical disadvantage for Democrats in the state. What Democrats have been able to demonstrate in the last few election cycles, though, is that if they're running against a very problematic Republican candidate, they may be able to make the case to get more Democrats to turn out to vote. But Democrats are going mm -hmm. to have to find every possible Democratic voter and make sure that they actually show up to vote in November. Otherwise, they probably will lose the race. Have you heard talk of irregularities, security concerns, anything that the secretary has been trying to avoid? Um, no, I haven't heard anything. I don't expect that there are going to be those types of, of allegations made um, tonight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be in part because Donald Trump is, is expected to coast to uh, to victory um, in the state. But it's, you know, it's important for us to keep in mind that Brad Raffensperger brings an engineer's eye to uh, to running elections. And so he has done everything humanly possible to make sure that there are no errors um, in the contest and that the vote is counted accurately and fairly. And I think voters should have confidence in that. 
Well, I'm glad you could come talk to us today. I don't know, with the apples to pears comparison, maybe I get a B in the class, but I'm trying, Andre Gillespie. It's great to see you. Happy primary day in Georgia. Come back and see us again. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. We are broadcasting to you live from Washington, where, of course, inflation data is not just something that markets pay attention to. It's something the White House pays attention to as well, Joe. President mm-hmm. Biden having to put out a statement in reaction to this slightly hot CPI we yeah. got today, saying, as he said in the State of the Union, we have more to do to lower costs and give the middle class a fair shot. That's right. And by that, I mean another four years <laughs> to finish the job. And that has been the refrain from the White mm-hmm. House. Maybe we hear more of that if we start to see a reacceleration here. I guess it's more of a plateau. Uh, but it makes us realize that this does not, or it reminds us that this does not move in a straight line. And we wanted to talk to Anna Wong uh, about that, who joins us from here in Washington. Uh, Bloomberg Economics Chief U.S. Economist. We're going all the way to the top here, <laughs> Anna. Thank you uh, for joining us. How would you characterize this? Is it a, a plateau at four tenths, or is there something else going on here? I think it is a sigh of relief, and that's the reason why the market was rallying in response uh, on the day of today's CPI release, as opposed to January, uh, even though the core CPI in January and February are the same at 0.4%. And the reason why is because everyone today was watching how the owner's equivalent rent uh, inflation Mm -hmm. is is doing. Uh, In January, that, uh, that OER category jumped. And it's supposed to be a stickier form of inflation. So everybody was worried. But in today's report, we saw that it, uh, it came back on track uh, to, for disinflation in the rest of the year. So that was what caused the sigh of relief. And Powell also thinks that um, rents, housing rents will be coming down, will be the key driver of disinflation this year. So I guess for everybody uh, who, who's... Uh, you know, driving the market rally yeah. today, it is it is due to that relief that one powerful force of disinflation is still on track. And yet, Anna, we're still not at 2%. You mentioned Fed Chair Jerome Powell. How is the Fed likely to look at today's data? Does it provide them any real evidence that they need to cut rates anytime soon that they should? Yeah, so, so, you know, also another factor contributing to the high reading today and January is this thing called uh, residual seasonality. Generally, businesses like to mark up prices in January and February. So I think Powell already know this because we heard from him in his testimony last week that he said he didn't need to see better inflation print. In fact, he even said it could be a little bit worse because uh, I think he expected that the seasonal factors will lead to higher January in February reading. And according to our projection, so even if inflation continue at this path and um, uh, we are still likely going to see um, the 12-month change in core PCE getting down to 2.5% or below by middle of the year. Gasoline and shelter contributing to over 60% here, Anna, of the overall monthly advance. One of those, in terms of energy, gas prices Uh, could be quite volatile. We could actually see some movement there. Is, Is it possible that that's the key to a lower reading next month? Well, yeah, you're right, Joe. Gasoline is very volatile. We just had two months of negative reading, so it could be that next month could be up or down. But the, most importantly, the Fed is going to look through gasoline. And we uh, rather, the Fed will be focusing on inflation expectations one year ahead. And from New York Fed's data yesterday, we saw that inflation expectations is actually coming down. So that's what matters for the Fed. All right, Anna Wong, Chief U.S. Economist for us at Bloomberg Economics. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us, especially on CPI Day. But of course, it isn't just CPI Day here in Washington. It is also Robert Her testimony 
day. As <laughs> Joe and I were it? talking about, today is the day in which he is appearing before the Judiciary Committee, along with other guests like the Oversight Committee Chairman, uh, yeah. Jim Comer, who came uh, to ask questions. And it, it's really showing a bit of partisanship, Joe, I would say, on how exactly the special counsel's report related to President Biden yeah. uh, is going down, depending on what side of the aisle. I love that on. Jim Comer came in to like, it was like yeah. a little, like a jazz improv session there with the... <laughs> chairman from the oversight committee this is interesting robert Hur is playing defense uh yeah. today and i go neither side seems to like what he's saying because he doesn't seem to be fulfilling the roles that they were hoping he would today is that fair well on the one hand democrats don't like what he said mm -hmm. in the report about the president Correct. and his poor memory as robert Hur described it on the other hand republicans don't like that robert Hur made the decision not to charge President Biden for willfully retaining documents when we've seen Donald Trump charged in his mm -hmm. own case in Florida with many counts uh, of willful retention of classified uh, secu national security yeah. information. So that's what you're really seeing play out in the in the room today. That's right. I think Republicans wanted him to talk about this Mr. Magoo that he met, though. Sure. And he's, he's not doing that. Democrats don't want to completely blow away his credibility because he also decided not to charge Joe Biden. Yes. And sees these two cases, the Biden and Trump cases, as being very different. Well, let's get another voice into this conversation. Joining us here in our studio in Washington is former Republican Congressman from Virginia, Denver Riggleman. Sir, always great to see you, especially to see you in studio at with us table. on Bloomberg TV <laughs> at the table. and at the radio. Table. At the table, indeed. Of course, you're not in the room with everybody else today, but is anyone getting what they want out of this testimony? If it's what, What's the point of it? I think the point is to make sure that they get YouTube videos that they can actually show back in their districts. Okay, so, so like any other hearing. Yeah, it's like shockingly <laughs> partisan, right? <laughs> so <laughs> you know, and so that's what, you know, that's what my consultants would tell me to do or my chief, right? You're just like, okay, Denver, who cares what the world is saying? You're talking to your district right mm -hmm. now. So what you're seeing, like when Comer comes in, it's the same thing. You know, it's a, uh, it's click type of politics. It's click politics right now. And why, I mean, it's really hard to split hairs and then try to make the Democrats and Republicans happy. Uh, and, you know, somebody who actually read the Mueller report, I know that's nuts, uh, but somebody who actually did it, um, I need to read the whole her report. But when you try to actually split the middle or you want to, you, you want to create a narrative on somebody's age or memory. Uh, at that level and then not charge at the same time. I really don't know what they were trying to do. When it's the law, it's either illegal or not. Mm -hmm. Maybe just talk about intent, but it, it's not surprising to me that it's shockingly partisan today. His, his line, I needed to show my work, Denver. Uh, the question, of course, why would you go there? Why would you even characterize his memory or his physical ability? You're not a doctor. Did he make the case for why? No, I don't think so. And I, I think that's the thing that surprised me a little bit. Almost, um, you know, it would be like me, you know, doing an investigation. I have this new AI company I have now, right? And it's like me doing an investigation. We get to that final point. And I'm said, well, we would actually go after this person. But you know what? Actually, they, they meant to steal a Snickers bar, not a zero bar from what we can see and uh, what we talked about. But on the other hand, so since, it, since he stole the wrong thing and he's not really very good at things, we're just not going to charge him. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's, okay. you know, and I, you either and I, did something wrong or you didn't. Or you didn't. And that's, and that's the same thing with the Mueller report. Either you did something wrong or you didn't. And I think when they're trying to split the baby and it's this political right now, I think it's really a detriment to the American people, and I think it's actually a bit of an insult. Well, of course, doing the business of the American people is what Congress was elected to do. They are literally representatives uh, of each of their districts. So w when we think about the business, they're doing hearings like this. They are potentially going to be voting on a TikTok bill tomorrow uh, that would yeah. see it banned if ByteDance doesn't divest it. And then on the 22nd, they're going to try to fund the rest of the government, the hard parts of the government to fund, including Homeland Security, the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. Is it is their work working? Are you confident that they're going to be able to do those next six appropriations bills when they're also doing things like we're seeing today? Uh, you know, t the short answer is no. I'm not very confident. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for instance, when, when I know some of these representatives actually trying to, I would say, ferret through the TikTok technology or what it actually means to actually ban TikTok, mm. or looking at other types of things. I don't know if they're behind the door actually talking about what other type of operations look with that type of technology when you talk about information operations or radicalization. I don't even think they have the ability to digest it. I don't think they have the intelligence to do so. I think when you're looking at the other bills, it's become so partisan. And now what do we have, a one or two seat separation, maybe mm -hmm. three seat separation based on who shows up that day? Let me tell you, I think it's going to be a knockdown drag out. And I think you're going to see the screamers and the partisans really coming to play. And I think it's going to be literally insane for a lot of the sane to watch them. I want 
you to tell us what happened with this TikTok thing, because six months ago, it was quiet. It was crickets. There was this massive effort to block the talk. We're going to ban it. There were four different bills, Democrats and Republicans acting like they liked each other. And then they hired lobbyists and dumped millions of dollars on the district, and the story went away. That in itself is a story, if you ask me. But how did it come back? Well, it's election year. <laughs> so, so, you know, with election year, there's probably some polling going on or things like that, or yeah. they're getting constituent calls, but also you have lobbyists on both sides. I mean, you think about TikTok going away, how does that open up the market for other competitors? Number one. Ask Number Donald two. Trump. Yeah, Ask Donald Trump. That was Absolutely. the word yesterday. Yes. This is about finances. This is about actually pay to play. This is rent seeking, right? So that's mm. what you're actually look- Gosh, I'm being very blunt here. I apologize. That's um, why that's we asked. But, uh, but that's, that's what's happening right now. The thing when you're talking about TikTok, I despise parts of TikTok based on the fact I was in information warfare. Sure. I sort of do that today, right, with the company that we have when mm-hmm. you're talking about it. And I've told people that information war is the forever war. When you're looking at TikTok, there's other things I would rather do to look at TikTok for data purposes and information rather than totally ban it. I think, again, but that's nuance. Now you're talking about you actually have to have Republicans and Democrats talking to experts in the technical field on the nuance of the specific bill. Mm-hmm. And nuance is not part of this tribalism that's going on today. It's like, you know, how many <laughs> sticks can I bang together and run through the woods and scream, you know, <laughs> painted in bizarre earth paints? You know, that's really what they're doing. And so that's uh, that's what you're seeing right now is you're seeing a lobbyist, a massive lobby flow coming in that's actually trying to dictate one way or the other where Democrats or Republicans are going to go in the TikTok situation. Hmm. Well, and of course, they in the House will have a chance to vote on this measure tomorrow. That's the working plan. This goes to the floor on Wednesday. The Senate, though, seems much more in question. And some of what you're hearing from senators who seem more reluctant about this particular legislation are concerns around maybe the First Amendment on constitutionality. Also, the fact that this is a private company specifically being called out Mm -hmm. in a piece of legislation. Are those concerns warranted? Well, the thing is, if you're banning TikTok, what does that do to Facebook? The mm-hmm. senator, you know, the, the Senate's showing some nuance right now. Mm-hmm. Now you're talking about, OK, what is the cutoff line when you're talking about radicalization and statistics or you're talking about ownership of a said corporation? And what does that actually do for the future of any type of, I would say, any type of controls on this type of language? I mean, that, you know, for me, being a First Amendment guy and also understanding that there's really bad things happening in the radicalization space, there has to be nuance, where, again, you're not really representing the American people. You're representing special interests based on what your fundraising looks like Mm -hmm. and based on what your polling and crosstabs looks like. And I get it. You want to win your race, but maybe do something and tell the truth to the American people. Try to have some nuance in your thinking when you're going forward. Nuance, that is not a word that no, I don't, I don't even know if they know how to spell here. that. Yeah, you know, that it's like N-E-W-A-N-C-E true. or something. You know, that's how they spell it in Congress. As we spend time with someone who knows, the former Congressman Denver Riggleman is with us here on Balance of Power. Uh, we're going to spend time later today uh, with the president of Poland okay. uh, on the later edition of Balance of Power. Mm-hmm. He's meeting with Speaker Mike Johnson right now. The matter of Ukraine, mm-hmm. of course, is what they're talking about. What does Mike Johnson say to a foreign head of state like this coming with an ask when there is absolutely no answer uh he's dancing on eggshells right now and what he's trying to do is use a lot of big syllable words to say nothing Hmm. that's what's happening behind closed doors right now and you know i wonder mike johnson has got to have i don't want to say this in a a really a come to jesus on what's going on in ukraine and i think uh, i think uh i think poland can help him with that Uh, There's got to be funding for Ukraine. Anybody who's outside of that box right now, I think, is in real trouble because if we actually take away funding from Ukraine or that support, Poland's going to be very worried about Russia right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, again, I would love to be in that uh, discussion right now. You know, my background is Eastern European affairs. I deployed there, you know, uh, for uh, Operation Allied Force on the uh, Romanian-Serbian border. I know a little bit about Russia. Uh, just a little, uh, but I would love to be in there right now. But I can't imagine how that conversation is going with Mike Johnson having to appeal to the base of his party in the Freedom Caucus right. and talking, you know, to a representative from Poland at that level. It just it's it, it's got to be a mind numbingly crazy conversation right now. Well, and not just the members of his own conference, but former President Trump as well, who we know has opinions on on Ukraine and whether or not the U.S. should continue to fund the war or just make sure the war comes to an end uh, in whatever capacity. If you were in Poland, if you were part of the Polish government, would you fear a second Trump administration? Should they? Anybody sane should. Yeah. And I, and I would say that the, the head of the Freedom Caucus is in Mar-a-Lago, by the way. So, uh, I mean, that's really what we got. And I would say that the speaker actually go to Mar-a-Lago before he actually makes any decision going forward because President Trump is the nominee for the uh, presidential race in 2024 and could possibly win. So, yeah, I think, um, I think what you're seeing right now, um, 
I would think that anybody who's sane in the Polish government is like, for the, for the love of God, we hope that Trump doesn't win. Pretty remarkable. He's meeting with the president a little bit later on. 4 p.m. Before he makes his way here. Uh, Kaylee, I suspect that'll be a very different conversation. But he'll be able to tell the president about what he heard today. Absolutely. And I think they're going to be very blunt in that conversation. And again, I can't believe as the United States of America, we have a GOP that's mostly against Ukraine funding. It seems like we're an upside down world right wow. now. Must be incredible coming back to Washington and walking freely as a former congressman. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Say whatever you want. I would rather stick a pencil in my eye than be in Congress right now, so I'm happy. <laughs> uh, never one to always mince colorful. words. <laughs> Don't be a stranger. Great to see you, as Great always. Great to see you, John. Denver Riggleman, the former congressman, former Air Force Intelligence, uh, founder of Rig Security and author of The Breach, the untold story of the investigation into January 6th. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Thanks for being with us. Tuesday edition of Balance of Power here on Bloomberg TV and radio and on YouTube. You can always find the podcast if you showed up late. Go to Apple, Spotify, wherever you do that stuff and subscribe. As we focus on the economy, of course, something that is of dire concern to the Biden administration with CPI Day bringing hotter than expected inflation. And Kaylee, this is the second time in a row we've seen a hotter than expected print, getting some folks to wonder, is this bad news for Joe Biden? Could we see a reacceleration of inflation? That would not be out of the question. Or could we just see stalling progress in a deceleration That's of right. inflation. If this all proves sticky, does the price pressure relief that has been underway continue? Mm -hmm. And of course, this isn't just potentially a problem for political figures like the president of the United States, but non-political figures as well, like say the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Because of mm. course, Joe, the market is still anticipating that by midway through this year, the Fed could be cutting interest rates. The problem is if inflation yeah. isn't doing what they want, mm -hmm. is the Fed going to feel comfortable doing that? These are big questions. When you're trying to plan a campaign, never mind forecast the economy. Absolutely. And they're big questions that we pose to our guests, like the one joining us now. We're very lucky to say Danny Blanchfauer, a tenured professor of economics at Dartmouth College, is with us. Professor, always great to have you on Bloomberg TV and radio. When you look at the data today, some of the more sticky components of inflation, uh, potentially, that we're watching here, do you see signs that policy can or should ease in the not so distant future? Well, there's nothing in the data today, I think, that changed my view from yesterday. Uh, and I always say to people, I mean, I was a person who sat and set interest rates. And I think very mm -hmm. often the debate in public is not quite the debate the policymakers have. Because when you change interest rates, that impacts things in about 18 months' time. And you always should be thinking, what, you know, what's going to happen there? And has this latest piece of information changed my view of things? And I think the answer to that is no. We're running steady. But the problem, and you're rightly picking it up, is that the, the economy has been a puzzle. Inflation has remained stickier than you would have thought, given the rate rises. And consumer spendings remain stickier and, and held up more than you would have thought. There are, however, worrying signs. Uh, and I would be focused on, on, on the labor market um, and also looking at the rest of the world because the UK and other European countries are clearly in recession. China is pretty slow. So the answer is I don't think there's much would change my view. The big issue still is have those rate rises that have been in place for a while now, have they fully had an effect? And the Fed, I guess, will mm -hmm. be sitting, waiting and watching. I don't think it rules anything out. The market's a little up on the news, but... But I, I'm worried that something bad's still coming. Danny Blanchflower, last time you joined us, we made clear that you would have failed me in your economics class. So I'm going to be careful here. <laughs> but based on what you just said, no, if I you're setting interest test, rates, <laughs> that's <laughs> I, it's all right. I can copy from Kaylee's paper in here. <laughs> I, I, but if you're so 18 cold. months out on interest rates, that would indicate yeah. that we're not there yet, right? That there is more of an impact to come. Well, I would have thought so. I mean, things, if, if you think of that logic, we, as central bankers call it the forecast horizon thing. I mean, in, in a sense, that's what we have to think about. I, I would like to just focus back on some worrying signs. The question, yeah. in a sense, is always the two sets of worrying. Consumer confidence predicts recession. 
The other thing that tells you you're in recession, particularly, is in the labor market. And I think very worrying has been the big employment drops that you've seen on the household mm -hmm. account in the last four or five months. Even bigger, the last six months, the declining in employment on that account is even bigger than it was in the last six months in 2007 as the recession started. So maybe you know, the dream world we're in, the positive environment we're in will continue. But there are worrying signs that, because that's that in a sense is the, is the thing that picks up recession. So in a sense, the, the Fed must always think, well, okay, there, there are worrying signs here. To err on the side of actually cutting rates would probably be the right thing to do. Um, I probably would, you know, as, I, as I was known as a dub, I would certainly be considering a rate cut. I certainly would rule out, as others have suggested, anything about a rate rise because the risks, I think, are to the downside. And the market seems... Well, we talked... Well, Danny, we talked about the labor market where you see some concern with the acting labor secretary here in the U.S., Julie Su, just last night on Balance of Power. I asked her specifically about wages because she was touting the higher wages that people have received in part due to union contracts that have been negotiated over the last year and whether or not that could refuel inflation, lead to that kind of wage price spiral people often talk about. This was her response to that question. We want to see real wage increases because more money in workers' pockets is a good thing. More money in the, you know, at, at the kitchen table, right, where families are making hard decisions about what they're going to buy and how to, you know, how to, right, how, how, to, how to live a secure life. You're never going to hear me say that making sure that um, working people get what they deserve is a bad thing. I don't think that we have to choose between uh, people, families paying uh, prices that they can afford and getting wages that are going to allow them uh, to, to feel some security. It's a false choice. So she says it's a false choice, Danny. She also went on to tell us that what we're seeing in the labor market is the, the very definition of a soft landing, that there doesn't need to be a decision made between getting inflation under control and potentially breaking the labor market. To what extent is that actually true? Well, I think um, that, that you start, you've started to see some real wage growth. And obviously, that's a good thing. And I think the contrast to the wage price spiral we saw in the past was when there were union contracts that built in escalator clauses, automatic escalator clauses. Mm -hmm. Inflation, we haven't really seen any of that. We've seen a little bit emergence of worker power as, as economies have, have strengthened. Uh, and we've seen a little bit of a pickup in strike activity across the United States. But I don't think there's any evidence of a wage price spiral. And economies take a little time to move. The balance of power between labor and capital has swung over the last two decades so strongly in the favor of capital. It would be hard to tell people, aha, a slight movement back towards labor means that the, the central bank has to plunge in again and make workers worse off. Certainly not something in a sense you, that you'd expect the Biden administration to want to see. So I think it is really sitting pat holding with expectations that perhaps we will see worsening in labor markets, worsening in other things, and the central bank will, will, will have to cut rates not least because of what's going on in the world. Look at what's going on in China. China is just seems to have just come out of a deflation situation. But the rest of the world is looking at America as a as a as a fine place to, to, to in the economy doing well. The last thing they want to do is make another error. We're talking about today's CPI data and the economy with Danny Blanchflower. Lastly, uh, Danny, gas prices a big part of this CPI report. Is that the wild card uh, that will tell? whether Joe Biden has a good economy to tout by the end of this campaign? Well, I mean, oil prices are a pretty tough one to forecast, given the stuff that's going on in the Persian Gulf and, um, right. and, and all the problems that are there. Um, the ability to control the global oil price is pretty, it's pretty, despite what Donald Trump and others say, the president of the United States doesn't actually control the global, the global oil price. It's called a global price and, and global shocks impact it. So I think we'll see. I think that's obviously uh, if there was to be a considerable spike in the in, a, in oil, that would be bad because it would be it would Im impact people, even impact their spending because they have to spend more at the pump. So, yes, I think it's something that you really want to be mindful for. But again, once off spikes of the oil price are not something that the central bank should respond to. It's uh, once off things just will they'll spike today. They'll have an effect on inflation today. And in 12 months time, they'll drop away. 
but you know, the, 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 these are complicated issues. The central bank has done pretty darn well. I didn't think the economy would be doing as well. And I, well, I, in a sense, I've been a, more of a doom merchant than I probably should have been. But we'll see going forward. We can't <laughs> assume everything's rosy with an election coming. Well, that is the exact place I wanted to go with you, Danny, because sure, monetary policy definitely has an influence on the economy, but fiscal policy does as well. And actually, in the statement that President Biden put out uh, addressing today's CPI report, saying there is more work to do to bring prices down, he said, look, I requested a lot of this in my budget. And as we heard in the State of the Union last week, the idea that he wants to see uh, you know, tax breaks for people who own homes within certain income groups, child uh, care universal pre-K, these kinds of things that may not actually become reality, but he's at least asking uh, for them, coupled with higher taxes on the rich and on on companies. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look through the budget, but how should we be thinking about fiscal policy's influence on the economy now and going forward if some of these things actually do become a reality? Well, I, th- I think the, re- the reality is that you know, this whole, whole series of economics papers particularly from a famous economist called Ray Fair, who talked about um, how elections are won and how important the state of the economy is in determining whether the incumbent wins or not. So I don't think the administration has missed that fact and understands that if people are feeling good on the economy, the, the incumbent gets the credit for it. And oftentimes you'll see even manipulation in the sense that the budget disproportionately spent in places that the president would like to win himself and for his party to win. So, so you, you'd expect to see that right now. Uh, and in some mm-hmm. sense, the, the Congress says, well, look, you know, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give the incumbent uh, um, help. But that's really where we are. A booming economy is good for the incumbent. If the, if the unemployment rate rises, inflation rate rises, then the, then the narrative will be the president is to blame for it. But in a sense, he can say, well, look how good the economy is. Look how good it is compared to the rest of the world. This does look like a rosy scenario. Vote for me. And so this is crucial. This is crucial, not just the scale of the budget, but who it's spent on and where it's spent. And you'd expect it to be spent disproportionately if the president could have his way in places that are important for him to win. We'll let you get back to fishing, Danny. It's great to see you, Danny Blanchard, <laughs> yes. back with us from Dartmouth College. I hope you're well. Uh, let's keep tabs with Danny as we work our way through the cycle. This is kind of interesting as you've started this line of questioning now, Kaylee. Mm-hmm. I feel like we check back every couple of months, see how he feels. Absolutely, mm-hmm. as we should, especially as we progress into the summer months when potentially we're going to be having more realistic conversation True about uh, cutting back rates. And he seems to be a little bit more worried about what's happening in the labor market than we yeah. often hear here. He went back to it a couple of times mm-hmm. without being asked, which is important. Uh, yeah, we'll find out about that lag effect when we get into the middle end of the summer when it really does count, to Kaylee's point, going into uh, the debates in the general. Thanks for listening to the Balance of Power podcast. Make sure to subscribe if you haven't already at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find us live every weekday from Washington, D.C. at noontime Eastern at Bloomberg.com.